So today I'll be taking you through a tour of Catalyst, which is um, the newest way to interact with quantum programs and quantum hardware and simulators through Penny Lane. So before we get started, I'll just give a quick overview of who we are and what we actually want to achieve here at Xanadu when I talk about Penny Lane and quantum programming. So Xanadu, our core mission here is we want to build quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. So this is the kind of the underlying mission that drives everything that everyone here at Xanadu is working hard to do every single day. So briefly a bit about us. We were founded in 2016 here in downtown Toronto. Um, and we've grown significantly since then. So I think when I joined, we started off with about, there, there were maybe 15 people when I touched down here in Toronto in 2017. Now we're above 150 people. I can't even tell you how many because we have um, such an incredible team that's growing constantly just to bring us further towards that mission of having those quantum hardware and quantum computing devices be available to everyone. So here at Xanadu, we're split into maybe three core areas. So first and foremost, we're a hardware company. So we're working with quantum photonics and quantum optics to build integrated chip quantum hardware devices. And here in Toronto, we have a lab in, um, right in downtown on the uh, 29th floor, uh, building out these integrated quantum photonic processes. We also do a lot of quantum research and algorithm design. So we have a dedicated team that's thinking about characterization, quantum error correction, as well as what we actually can do with fault-tolerant quantum computers once we have them. And then finally, one of our other focus areas is open source quantum software. And so this is part of the company I've been working in for the last five years or so now. And this is the area I'm quite excited to lead you through, like what's coming up in 2023 when it comes to open source quantum software that we're developing here on the Zadu and Penny Lane teams. And so what quantum programming may look like by the end of 2023. So what is it that we try to do on the quantum software side here at Xanadu? Something that, especially um, myself in my role here at Xanadu, what we're thinking about every single day is how can we make it easier for researchers to explore and build things with quantum computers? This is really what's driving us, what's making us build out this open source quantum ecosystem. How can we provide the tools that bring value, not just to um, Zanadu, but to the entire quantum ecosystem and quantum community. How can we enable more research? How can we drive forward progress in quantum algorithm design and quantum research in general? It's also a very difficult question. <laughs> and to answer this question, I'm going to take a slight detour and talk about why we need quantum software, because I think the answer to this question of how do we enable research not just short-term research, but also longer-term research, research over the next one, two, three years, that will be incredibly important in both how we build and use quantum computers, we need to start talking about quantum software. So something that I think we tend to focus a bit on, especially in physics, if we look at the history of physics over the last 100, 200 years, we tend to think of revolutions in in how we approach physics and our understanding of the world in terms of concepts. So we, we largely tend to think about concept-based revolution. Examples include um, electromagnetism at the end of the 19th century and the exploration of thermodynamics. And I think the beginning of the 20th century was also a very, very big time for this as well, because we had amazing new theories that resulted in concept-based revolutions, which is namely quantum mechanics, and uh, special, relatively, special relativity and general relativity. So I think we tend to place a significant amount of weight on these concept-based revolutions. But something I want to emphasize or sort of bring your attention to is that a lot of scientific-based revo uh, scientific revolutions are largely tool-driven. And they sometimes can go a bit under the radar com compared to those really big concept-based revolutions. So examples include things like telescopes. They really opened up uh, our knowledge of astronomy and astrophysics, just this new tool that came along that allowed us to view things and measure things that we hadn't been able to in the past. Um, similarly, 
X-ray crystallography was huge in how we um, built up our understanding and applications in molecular chemistry and biology. And then another similar example is the polymerase uh, chain reaction, or PCR, for the studying and sequencing of DNA, which caused a massive paradigm shift in how we explore uh, medical technologies and biotechnology. So tool-based revolutions are really, really important, and we often don't give them the same weight as we do those really well-known concepts-based revolutions. And the reason that I, I've gone on this brief segue is because software really is a tool that can drive revolutions. We can think of software similarly to telescopes in astronomy. And a really, really cool example, actually, is statistical machine learning, or just machine learning in general. So machine learning has been a um, big area of research for many decades now, the 60s, 70s, 80s. And in the 80s, we actually began um, discovering and building up important algorithms, such as backpropagation. At the same time, it's really been since the early 2010s and onwards that we've had this sort of huge machine learning revolution. And when we sit back and sort of ask ourselves why that is, you can kind of tie it back into this idea of tool-based revolutions and software potentially being a big tool in this case. So for example, we had workhorse algorithms such as backpropagation in the 80s, but it wasn't until the 2010s that we started to get both accessible hardware, so GPUs and TPUs and things that really allowed us to scale up what we could do in machine learning, but also, and very, very importantly, specialized user-friendly software. Packages like TensorFlow and PyTorch, just making sure that we had packages that were not only available for people, but were very accessible. They were well documented, they were easy to install, and they caused a revolution in what we can do with machine learning, but also in machine learning research itself. So that brings us kind of full circle back to quantum software. Why quantum software? If we look at the world through tool-based revolutions, and we look at the example from machine learning, we can see that quantum software is actually a very valuable research tool um, for multiple reasons. So there's a, one very obvious reason is that with quantum software, we're able to access quantum hardware, which is super important. Quantum hardware, in a sense, is kind of almost like a, a tool within this tool-based revolution of, in quantum computing. We have been exploring quantum computing as a concept since the late 80s, early 90s. But the ability for non-experimentalists, for theorists, to be able to just access quantum hardware and submit things and use it day to day um, is changing the way that we are able to discover and do new research. But I think it also goes beyond that. It's not just quantum software's ability for us to access quantum hardware, which makes it so valuable. In a sense, I think quantum software is driving a revolution in quantum computation um, due to two sort of connected um, concepts. The first is uh, what I like to call research-driven software. So this is a concept where the research that we're doing day-to-day, -day, the research that we're doing in industry and in academia is driving forward software in that people are discovering new things and wanting to make it available in software packages like PennyLay and like KissKiss. Um, this is helping to make research reproducible, accessible, and generalizable in the sense that anyone who wants to share their research can then make that feature available in software, which opens up the ability for others to very easily reproduce this research that they've only recently seen. And not only that, but actually generalize it, use that research as a starting point and start to go beyond it. And this is almost existing in a feedback loop with what I like to call software-driven research. So as we add new features to software, we're also unlocking new avenues of research. One very big example, and I'll explain more a bit later, is in Penny Lane. We are adding um, integration with machine learning libraries into quantum software and quantum hardware through Penny Lane. And these new techniques that machine learning gives us is unlocking new avenues of research that we can do with quantum hardware. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Penny Lane, especially if you start doing the um, hackathon or quantum coding challenges for QHack. Uh, for those not familiar, Penny Lane is a Python library for differentiable programming of quantum computers. So what we want to do is we want to be able to allow anyone 
researchers, those who are just curious in quantum, um, those searching for quantum applications and algorithms, to be able to rapidly prototype and explore uh, utilizing quantum hardware and, and quantum algorithms within existing classical frameworks. So it provides the ability for you to not only access quantum hardware and quantum simulators, but to also build up very uh, flexible models and algorithms. And in addition to this, connect it with machine learning. So I mentioned TensorFlow and PyTorch in the past. What this allows you to do is to actually integrate with TensorFlow and PyTorch and make them quantum aware in the sense. So you can not only train your quantum computer, but train through your quantum computer. So this is something that we've actually very, very focused on in Penny Lane. We want to ensure that in Penny Lane, everything is differentiable. So we want to provide that flexibility where you can make arbitrary building blocks. You can take um, quantum circuits, you can take classical pre and post processing and combine them in arbitrary manner. And not only that, but you can then differentiate through the entire thing. And you might be wondering, like, why is this important that everything in Penny Lane is differentiable, that we're creating this bridge between differentiable classical programming like TensorFlow and quantum hardware? Uh, the answer is because it gives us flexibility in how we, how we explore quantum algorithm design. Not only can we now train uh, the quantum hardware parameters that we're using, but we can also train the quantum structure itself, or we can train the model of our, we can, we can train the entire model structure. We're not uh, confined to a very rigid approach where we have you know, weights that we, in a neural network and we can only alter those weights, but we can also, over an optimization loop, train how this model looks and acts completely, which is a very, very powerful tool. And this is a really good example that I like. Um, so this is a screenshot that I've actually taken off the Penny Lane website. So anyone, if you're interested in reading more about this, you can just go to pennylane.ai and look up differentiable Hartree Flock in our demonstration section. But this is a really nice example of that feedback loop between um, software-driven research and research-driven software. So in this particular example, we have in Penny Lane the ability to do quantum chemistry. And a big part of this is something that's called the hartree flock method, which is a way of computing um, uh, energy states of molecules, which are then important inputs to in, uh, near-term quantum algorithms such as uh, VQE, the variational quantum eigensolver. And what our development team realizes is that if we take this hartree flock solver and we make it differentiable, when we feed this into the quantum hardware later, we actually have a situation where we can not only train our variational quantum eigensolver to find the minimal energy of our molecule, but we can train the entire thing beginning even before the Hartree Fox computation. So what we can actually do is while we're training the quantum hardware to find the minimal energy of the system, we can also train the Hartree Fox method to optimize the molecular geometry. And this is actually something that you're seeing on the right hand side here in this GIF. As we're finding the minimal energy, we're also optimizing the positioning of these two atoms in this molecule. And so the really cool thing about this, this feedback loop I'm demonstrating here is that we identified something cool we could do in the software. We modified the software to allow us to do this. And then this opened up a new research opportunity, which is, hey, let's explore how we can do this uh, optimization of molecular geometries on quantum hardware. And so it went through the process of idea, new feature in software, new research paper, and then based on that research paper, more software features were fed back into the software itself. So a really cool example, and don't hesitate to check it out if you're interested to read more. So I guess you're wondering, the title of my talk is The Future of Quantum Programming, and that all sounds really cool so far. So what is the future of quantum programming? What do we need to improve? What does quantum programming at the end of 2023 look like? So there are still a lot of issues I think that we need to um, solve if we want to make quantum programming more accessible. So something that's quite common is that a lot of um, the quantum hardware we access, they're accessed via remote API calls to an online um, cloud system, for example. And when you submit your job via those online APIs, you enter a queuing system and you have to wait for your quantum job to go through the queue. It could be very busy, it could be very fast, execute on the hardware and then the results are returned to you. 
And this is often fine if we just want to do a single quantum computation. But if we have a model where we have lots of complicated classical processing, both before and after the quantum computation, and perhaps we even have more quantum computation that depends on previous quantum computation, this can add a lot of latency. With almost every step in our workflow, we have to submit to our online cloud system, get the results, wait for it to come back, do another computation, and then go through that whole process again. So it can really slow down a lot of these near-term sort of hybrid quantum classical programs. In addition, something we're noticing that is, is that as the hardware and algorithms we're interested in scale up, the Python classical pre and post processing that we're doing are becoming bottlenecks. They're getting to the point where the amount of time required to do this processing in Python is, might, might even be longer than the amount of time required to query the quantum hardware device. And I think this ties into the last point as well, which is that it's with the power of classical high performance computation, such as GPU, supercomputing centers, clusters, we want to be able to use that alongside quantum hardware. And how can we best do that to avoid these previous problems I was speaking about, such as this high latency between the classical and quantum compute? So one example we have is just-in-time compilation. And this is from, um, so this is real code that works in Penny Lane at the moment. In this code, um, I'm using a hardware device through our Amazon Bracket integration. Um, and the important thing to note here is that I'm using a feature from Jack called just-in-time compilation. And the very nice thing about this feature is that when you first execute your quantum function in Penny Lane, it will actually compile the workflow that you've specified out of Python and into a low-level machine binary that is much more efficient to call and execute after that first compilation time. So here's our quantum functional kernel. You can see that we've got Python control flow within it. Um, and below, we just call it like any other Python function. The key thing is that it executes on the quantum device. We can continue integrating with packages like TensorFlow, PyTorch, SciPy, Scikit-learn. But it's incredibly more efficient just because we are compiling this function on the first call. And we have a very highly optimized machine binary we can query for subsequent calls. And as you can see, hardware compatible automatic differentiation continues to work perfectly. So this works in Penny Lane now, but it's not ideal. In that example, you saw that I had a quantum hardware device. And while we've engineered Penny Lane to work, what's actually happening is that very highly optimized machine binary, when you call it, all the classical parts of the, of the uh, computation are highly optimized and compiled that when we call the quantum hardware, we still have to call back to Python. We still have to enter that queuing system. We still have to submit the uh, quantum job. So some of the drawbacks are still there. So basically, how can we take this amazing idea that was um, provided by Jax, which is this ability to keep working in Python, use the same environment such as notebooks you're familiar with, but take advantage of the ability to compile not just the classical part, but your entire hybrid quantum classical workflow. And uh, this is sort of the, um, the background behind Catalyst, this project that we've been building here at Zadu um, by our Penny Lane team. So this idea is, can we bring this just-in-time compilation that Jax has made very famous for Python and machine learning uh, to Penny Lane and to hybrid quantum classical systems in general. So I'll, I'll give a brief overview of what we've been building with Catalyst as well as what you can expect from, um, from the future. So our goals stay very much the same with Catalyst with the previous goals I was talking about when it comes to Penny Lane. We want to make quantum plus classical accessible, but also very performant for researchers. We know that when you're doing research, it's important to be able to explore and rapidly prototype with small toy models, but then to very easily scale up your research to ensure that you know, it continues to work and it works in interesting regimes. And most importantly, we want to be able to enable you to target all the devices that you need for your workflow, whether they're quantum hardware, quantum simulators, or also classical devices like GPUs. 
Uh, so here is the very first, I think, public screenshot of what Catalyst looks like. For those of you familiar with Penny Lane, you can see that it's actually very similar. We're still um, importing Penny Lane here at the top. We've still got our device. In this case, we're using our high-performance lightning simulator. And we have our Q node that's using the standard Q node decorator, um, quantum operations, and we're calling it like any quantum function. The only difference you'll see in the screenshot is this QJIT decorator, which we're importing from Catalyst. And by using this QJIT decorator, we're entering this completely new compilation pipeline that we've built that works in a sense like JAX.JIT. You use QJIT above your um, quantum functions or your hybrid workflow, and you enter this ability to compile not just the classical parts, but everything, including the quantum instruction set. And the really cool thing about Catalyst and what it enables is it provides the ability to do uh, a lot more than we're used to in standard Penny Lane. So something that we're able to do is we're able to arbitrarily mix and match classical control flow with quantum operations and quantum measurements. And this is compiled down to a binary that uh, a quantum hardware device, for example, will be able to uh, potentially natively execute. So in this example here, we're still using lightning.qubit, um, which is our simulated device and the first devices we've updated to work directly with Catalyst. And you can see that we have, oh, you can see that we have mid-circuit measurements where we're applying operations, measuring them, and then using that measurement as the input to other operations. So this is something that um, is enabled through Catalyst. This is also something you can currently do with the latest version of Penny Lane. You can do mid-circuit measurements. The important thing to note here is how this is happening. We've QGISed this, and so we're compiling down, or sort of taking out of Python this definition of a mid-circuit measurement quantum function and producing a very highly optimized and compiled binary behind the scenes, which can be run very close to the quantum hardware and very efficiently. Um, and this is where it gets very interesting because we can start to do stuff that you can't do in the non qgis version of Penny Lane. Uh, so, for example, here we have very complicated um, classical con control flow inside of our GIS's quantum function. So we have an if statement, for example. Depending on whether this parameter is larger than 1.4, we're adding an Rx or a Hadmod gate, or otherwise we're applying a different gate, an Ry gate. And then around this conditional if statement, we have a for loop. And um, you can see that we're applying this for loop for n separate operations. So this is similar in a sense as well to mid-circuit measurements on the previous slide. We are compiling this entire workflow. I really want to emphasize this. So when you QGIT this function, what's actually happening is we're tracing through this hybrid workflow we're looking at the conditional statements, the classical instructions, and the quantum instructions, and we're generating a low-level intermediate representation that then we can compile and optimize. And when I say optimize, we're optimizing the quantum part and the classical part. And then we end up with something that you can execute outside of Python, close to the hardware and the classical compute. So maybe it's a bit difficult to sort of visualize this because one of the key things we're looking for is that we want to sort of enable the same Penny Lane workflows and user experience that you're used to when you use Penny Lane, but to just provide this decorator QGIS that allows this new pipeline, this new compilation process to happen behind the scenes that provides these advantages, these performance improvements. Um, so this is just a quick demonstration to actually show what is happening a bit behind the scenes. So very briefly here on the right, we're starting off in Python, um, and we're using JAX with Catalyst. So this is very important. The first version of Catalyst that we're building up right now is natively JAX compatible. So you can continue to use JAX. You can continue to use your favorite JAX functions, and all of these will be recognized and compiled alongside the quantum instructions. So we're starting off actually by hooking into JAX's tracing ability to sort of 
identify and recognize this hybrid quantum classical programming. We're then lowering this into a intermediate representation that's commonly used in machine learning and classical compilation called MLIR. And it's here in MLIR where a lot of these uh, important classical optimizations, such as loop optimizations, loop unrolling, as well as quantum optimizations, quantum compilation, for example, occur. In addition, we've also built in auto disk support, so the ability to do things like the parameter shift rule to get quantum gradients. From here, as we do this optimization approach, we end up with uh, LLVM QIR uh, instruction sets. And the QIR is an important standard that's being developed by the QIR Alliance to build in the uh, quantum instruction sets into this existing ecosystem of classical compilation tools. And then finally, we have this um, intermediate representation which we can compile. And once it's compiled, we can send it to a device in this case, Penny Lane Lightning Simulator for execution. So here I'm specifying keep intermediate equals true, and this just ensures that in this demonstration, you can actually extract and visualize the different uh, intermediate representations that happen in this compilation step. So this is the first one I mentioned. We're first using JAX to extract a JAX um, compatible representation of this program. We are then uh, converting this into MLIR, or multi-level intermediate representation, which is a, for those familiar with LLVM, this is a um, higher level intermediate representation. So you can retain a lot of that information that's super important, like loop constructs, tenses. Um, and by retaining a lot of this high level information, it means we can be actually quite clever in how we're doing a lot of our compilation techniques, both the classical and the quantum compilation. So once we have this intermediate representation, MLIR, we perform a lot of classical and quantum optimization, transformations, and we end up with low-level LLVM and QIR. So these are the very low-level instructions, both classical instructions and quantum instructions, that uh, quantum hardware devices, quantum simulators, will be able to understand and natively run and execute. So this is sort of just demonstrating behind the scenes, this is actually a very different, very novel uh, execution pipeline compared to what actually happens in, in existing Penny Lane. But, and you're able to access this with only the most minor of UI modifications, which is this at QGIS decorator. And I think this is the most exciting thing to me. So in all the examples I've shown you before, uh, I've been compiling or QGISing a single quantum node. So I've been QGISing a single quantum hardware execution, for example. But the power of this quantum JIT goes beyond that. It's not, a, um, it's not that we can only QGIT a single quantum hardware execution, but we can JIT the entire optimization loop. So something that is very common in variation algorithms these days is you might have a, a quantum circuit. So here I've got circuit at the top. Um, we're computing the cost and the gradient of this quantum circuit. And then we might have, want to have an optimization loop over the circuit where we compute the gradient, do a standard algorithm like gradient descent, and then have a for loop. And here I'm using jax.lax.4i loop to loop over this cost function and continuously update the parameters to minimize the output of this quantum circuit function. And the really cool thing I want to point out here is that we have the QGIT decorator, not just on the cost function itself, so we're not jitting just the single execution, but over the entire optimization loop. And what this means is that one of the issues I mentioned earlier was that um, you could be in a situation where you have your quantum execution sent out to a service to be executed, but then you've got this latency period where you're constantly coming back for your local optimization loop or local classical processing. What's happening here is that we're jitting this entire workflow, we're jitting the optimization loop as well. So we're creating a binary 
that contains this loop from zero to 100. And we're executing that right beside the device. So we're able to move a lot of the external classical portions and processing of this uh, algorithm to a binary that can run beside the quantum hardware and beside any classical computers we want to use, such as GPUs. So a slightly more technical slide, just for those curious about what's actually happening under the hood. Um, so th this is maybe a bit more of a deeper dive into what I showed you on the previous slides when we looked into the intermediate representation. That we're essentially starting from Python here. We're lowering into this JAX representation using JAX. And from here, we're in MLIR, or multi-level intermediate representation. And the nice thing about MLIR is it allows us to represent high-level constructs, such as the quantum instructions, such as gradient instructions, such as control flow that interacts with quantum and classical, and provide optimizations that interplay between these. Once we've uh, lowered, we have uh, this low-level QIR, LLVM IR, that um, support heterogeneous execution. So, LLVM is a very, very well-known compilation framework. It can be used to execute on GPUs, TPUs, et cetera. So this already exists. This is a tool, this is a um, pipeline that exists for a lot of classical compute. And through using QIR from the QIR Alliance, we're able to create a binary that contains classical instructions that can be executed in TPUs and GPUs alongside quantum instructions that can run on the quantum runtime. Um, yes, yeah, so I just want to provide a brief summary of what you've seen today. Um, so our goal with Penny Lane remains the same. We want to provide that environment that is dynamic, familiar, and flexible for researchers to be able to get their research done, not just now, but in a year from now, in two years from now, in three years from now. Um, and the one way that we want to do this is by thinking about the future. How can we use Penny Lane with heterogeneous compute, how can we scale up algorithms, and how can we bring this amazing machinery that you might be familiar with from machine learning, this just-in-time compilation, to entire quantum hybrid uh, programs. So we basically want to get ready for the hardware and the infrastructure as well with tomorrow. And the final thing I just want to shout out is that Catalyst isn't available now, but it, it will be live very, very soon. So at the end of QHack, we'll be providing an experimental preview of Catalyst, and we'd love to invite you to try it out and experience the future of quantum programming. So it might not be fully uh, ready to replace everything that Penny Lane does, but we're working hard to make sure that it does get to that point. And so we'd love if you want to join us on this development journey. Um, maybe you have a hardware simulator that you want to integrate with Catalyst and explore what this new compilation pipeline means to you. Maybe you want to explore um, adding compilation passes, especially compilation passes that interplay between classical and quantum, um, or perhaps explore front ends into Catalyst. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you are as excited as I am, and keep an eye out post QHack uh, for more news, details, and preview of Catalyst. Thank you so thank you so much, Josh. Um, I am excited already. Uh, where can people uh, take a look? Where, where should we sign up to hear more information about Catalyst? Uh, that's a very good question. So if you haven't already signed up for the Xanadu newsletter, that's a really good place to sign up and updates will be coming through there. And also we'll be reaching out through the same social media accounts that you probably already following for QHack. So for example, LinkedIn, the Penny Lane uh, Twitter account. Um, if you're not already following them, do give them the fo a follow and uh, it will be one of the first places you hear about Catalyst. Okay, awesome. You heard it from Josh himself. Uh, if you want to get more info about Catalyst, you need to uh, follow Xanadu and Penny Lane on social media and the newsletter. And uh, then I guess we'll have more information about how you can contribute and how you can uh, make Catalyst better, right? Awesome. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Uh, so Josh, I have a few questions for you. Uh, my first question, uh, since you've been part of Penny Lane since before it was public, I want to hear the inside stories, the anecdotes of how yeah. it was to build, create Penny Lane. 
Um, sure. Yeah, no, building Penny Lane was a really, really fun experience. I think being there in 2017, 2018, sort of not the very beginning of the quantum software age, but like close to the beginning, it was just such an experimental time. Research papers were coming out all the time. It was starting to become a bit difficult to keep up. And that was the point where you could read a research paper proposing a new idea or suggesting something or et cetera, and think, this is a really cool idea. How can I expose this to everyone through quantum software? Is there something we can do beyond what maybe these papers have suggested that could be valuable as a whole? And that's kind of what happened with Penny Lane. I think we were seeing a lot of um, uh, quantum optimal control papers coming out. And they were sort of uh, exploring the edge of this idea of getting gradients out of quantum hardware. And it sort of sparked this idea that, hey, if we have a way of getting gradients out of quantum hardware instead of having to simulate it, this is a really cool thing because then we could integrate it with machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, like PyTorch, and we could make those frameworks quantum aware. So yeah, it, it was a really fun time, um, that sort of emergence of the entire quantum software industry. Yeah. Do you have any fun anecdotes about how it was at the office, uh, how many people were <laughs> working on it at the time and so? So I, I think development started 2018, maybe beginning 2018. And it started off as a, maybe a semi-research project with code attached. And I remember at the time, I think it was called OpenQML. That was our code name for it. Uh, which is funny in retrospect because it's not it's not as fun or interesting as the name we ended up going with after we launched, which was Penny Lane. Um, but yeah, 2018 was when we started launch, uh, working on OpenQML. Um, I think it was it was one or two people at the beginning. Um, so Maria was involved from the very beginning in terms of the research idea, the concept of this parameter shift rule. Um, I was more involved from the software design side. So sort of thinking about what is the user experience here? How do we want to make this available? And, and it's interesting because it kind of has a lot of overlap with Clem's talk. And Clem was speaking earlier about you know design in the quantum industry. That first year, 2018, it was a mixture of research on quantum gradients, um, how we integrate into machine learning frameworks that people are already using. And the third one was probably the most fun, which was how do we design a user interface which is fun to use and intuitive to use. And I spent a big part of 2018 playing around with that and like writing a lot of pseudo code and exploring and handing it to people and just sort of asking, hey, if I gave you this code, would you be able to tell me what it does to try and work out what is, a, what is the Penny Lane user interface? And actually the user interface we decided on in 2018 is pretty much the same one we're still using now. So it ended up being very, um, it, it's worked very well for um, all the applications and research that's come post-2018. Yeah, you did an amazing job because that's a lot of what people really love about Penny Lane is that it's intuitive and easy to use. So uh, that research that you did at that time definitely paid off. And uh, something that is also very important about Penny Lane and that I know you're passionate about is that it's open source. You know, We know you're passionate about open source software. So... If you could tell us more about the ecosystem and open source software, that would be amazing to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, it's something we've always really believed in strongly at Zadu, that we want, we, we want to be building open source software. Open source software is so valuable. Like so many of the tools we're using that Penny Lane depends on themselves are open source. And I think it's a mixture of we want to contribute back. We want to not only build something, but allow people to look at you know, how is this working internally? I think that's super, super important. Especially when you're doing a lot of research, you want to have a level of trust that the software that you're using for your research, you know, is right, it's, it's doing the right thing. And with open source software, you can do that. Um, but I think even more importantly, the biggest thing about open source software is that anyone can contribute back. And over the years, we've seen so many great contributions to Penny Lane. Not, not just Penny Lane, actually. I don't think this is spoken about enough, but the documentation itself. 
the, the documentation itself is also open source. And we've been astounded how many people have contributed back documentation. So documentation on functionality, how things work, but also on research, on you know, tutorials, on examples. Um, and yeah, I, I think I might have gone off on a tangent, but having Penny Lane and the documentation and the tutorials and everything about it be open source um, has just been amazing in that sense, to see that contribution from the community and also to sort of showcase what we're able to build. Yeah, and uh, sometimes uh, we're used to hearing the word, but we don't really think about what it means that a software is open source, right? So it's having that code available on GitHub and knowing that you can use it, uh, create a fork of your the repository and make your own version of it, modify it, uh, right? There are different licenses available. Yeah. Uh, so you can learn more about that. There are a ton of different platforms and uh, uh, people that work in this space. So uh, we also have some of our sponsors. Uh, I can think of the Quantum Open Source Foundation and the Unitary Fund who are really, um, I mean, we work closer together with them too. Yeah, and something I just want to add now that I'm thinking about it is that you, I guess you, even though Penny Lane is open source, it's sometimes, you know, you might not be able to tell, oh, it, Maybe Zanadu develops new versions in, in private and then pushes it to the public version. But really, everything we do is public by default. All the daily development, every new feature from beginning to end, we're, we're doing in public on our GitHub repo. So it's not just the code that's open source, but you can have a look at our open pull requests, our open issues to see what we're building and what will come in the next version. Yeah, and you can see kind of these conversations, uh, how they develop. I've seen people who have conversations on GitHub all the time and maybe a year later they get to meet and it's like, oh, wow, it's nice to look into <laughs> you through a different medium other than pull requests, right? Um, yeah, we've, we've even had pull requests for new features um, and then months later that turns into a paper and for a couple of months it could have been the case that, you know, there's this new concept and the only place it exists is an open source in the Penny Lane repo because the the, re, the paper hasn't been written yet. So I, I find that really, really awesome. Yes, that's exciting. Okay, we're going to go with some questions from the chat. We have a ton of questions. So, okay, there's one from Dentucky Kirby asking, would you recommend, uh, what would you recommend to a beginner looking to get into quantum programming? That's a really good question. Um, there's also tons of resources available online for quantum programming. Um, so definitely on the Penny Lane website, if you're interested in exploring um, quantum programming to learn quantum computation, we have the quantum codebook. I think codebook.zanadu.ai. And this is a cool resource for learning the fundamentals of quantum computing alongside you know, the, the Penny Lane code to, to build up that quantum programming knowledge. We've also got on the Penny Lane website demos and tutorials. They're a bit more focused on um, research and ideas in quantum computing, quantum chemistry, and quantum machine learning. They're a really nice starting point if you want to explore uh, what's happening actually in research for quantum computing and uh, what is the code to reproduce this research. But um, that's only the starting point. There are so many resources available online from the Penny Lane documentation to the code book to the Qiskit textbook, et cetera. Like, it, it's really nice that there is that breadth of content out there. Yeah, totally. So we have some specific questions about your talk. Uh, somebody asks, are there any constraints similar to Jax on functions that can be QJIT, for instance, pure functions? Uh, so the answer is yes, there will likely be re restrictions um, based on standard Python Penny Lane programs. So one example I can say straight away is that uh, we don't support native Python control flow around quantum operations at the moment. You have to use special control flow functions that I had in my slides that you import from Catalyst. Um, but at the same time, this is something we want to improve uh, as development of Catalyst goes on. So we want to try and make it so that as much as possible of what you see in standard uh, Penny Lane code examples will work when QGIS is. But yes, to answer the question, there will be some uh, restrictions coming in if you want to QGIS uh, Penny Lane workflow. Okay, nice. 
Uh, we have a question about Catalyst. So J. Ted CC asks, does Catalyst currently have integration with classical machine libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch? So at the moment, it works uh, primarily with JAX, and this is because we're relying on JAX's ability to um, trace out the program into, uh, as basically out of Python and into this MLIR intermediate representation. So the first version that we release in preview after QHack will be uh, JAX compatible. They're adding support for other machine learning frameworks is something we want to look to uh, in 2023. Okay, so uh, definitely everybody uh, keep checking our social media, see how that develops. Um, Warm Warm View uh, 1127 asks, you're a physics major student, but now your job is to design a new package. How do you learn to be a software engineer considering you start from majoring in physics? That's a good question. It's giving me existential crisis. <laughs> um, I think it, it, it's interesting because I did my PhD in physics um, before I joined Xanadu. And I think my PhD gave me a lot of the skills required to, um, to be able to learn quickly and to pick up new skills like this once I joined Xanadu. So my um, PhD was actually in computational physics. So I did a lot of uh, programming during that. But I, did, I, I didn't do too much actual software development, if you can distinguish that from programming. It was sort of like package development. So I came to Zadu knowing how to program as a researcher, but not how to um, you know, build open source quantum libraries from scratch. So definitely skills that I picked up on the job. Um, definitely a lot of the people in the early years of Zadu helped out and you know, taught me a lot of the stuff that I didn't necessarily know coming from my PhD. But yeah, I think doing um, definitely a postgrad degree in physics gives you a lot of these skills to be able to jump straight in and learn quickly and pick up these these skills. Yeah, nice. Um, let's check other questions. Uh, okay, we have a question on what is the main drawback of the differentiability constraint by exajam? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so, I mean, there are many advantages to the differentiability. The advantages being that you can train almost everything that you see in Penny Lane. So if you have an outcome you want to achieve, but you're not quite sure how to get there, you can apply all these optimization techniques in grid, such as gradient descent to um, try and achieve that outcome, even if you might have a sort of hole in the theoretical understanding of how to get there. In terms of drawbacks, uh, there's not too many I'm aware of. Um, sometimes I suppose there can be a bit of overhead if um, you are using a workflow where gradients might be computed that you might not need or want later on. Okay. Well, we've answered a lot of questions, but everybody, uh... I don't know, Josh, if you're going to be on the chat later, but maybe everybody keep asking your questions and you can answer each other's questions as well. Uh, I guess some of them uh, Josh can answer and some of them others can answer too. So uh, we will be back. So thank you so much, Josh. But we have more speakers lined up. So everybody just stay here. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Josh, though, we will have to say goodbye for now. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Josh.